Would you stand with us this morning as we sing, Great is the Lord. Among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. A couple of places in that tells us that we need to make known the works that he has done in our lives, that we might be able to rejoice in them. And so this morning we have a time of, of prayer and praise. And we always begin with an opportunity to praise the Lord of what he's done this week in our lives. And so uh, Kyle's got a microphone back there. Lift up your hands and there you go. There's Randy. Oh, yeah, I got a couple of things I wanted to say. Uh, one, uh, first thing, our grandson left for the Army a couple of weeks ago. He sent us a message this morning from his parents. He said uh, to tell everyone here how much appreciate the service he had put on the uh, YouTube. He said he was watching it on. He's been watching our service since he's uh, left for the Army. And he wanted me to tell everybody how much he loved it. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. And then I have a, a little testimony of God. It's just a little quick thing. I, God put me in the right place at the right time. God was next door to me. I came out of my I, I was graduating <laughs> but as soon as I turned and I, I, I first come around the corner, I was brushing my teeth and I walked into the living room and went straight out. I see out the window to his house. And there was a huge ball of flame just burning. I started looking and I was looking for him. And uh, the crowd, it was a good fighting crowd. The thing was in a whole entire ball of flame. And I started looking for him. Garden hose, and he started sprinkling. And then he walked back, and I was keeping an eye on him. And all of a sudden, he dropped down to his knees, and he just fell flat into the side of it. And he was out cold, laying face down. And I ran over to him, and uh, I got the squad there, and all that. <laughs> and he is okay. Great, great. He's up in Canton. Transferred. Okay. That's just a testimony of you know God put me standing there. That's right. In the right place at the right time to help a neighbor. <laughs> praise the Lord for that, Randy. Thank you. All right. Somebody else with a word of praise? 
Over here, Pastor Cherry. Uh, but anyway, Sister Linda, right before church, handed me a name with a phone number on it, and apparently they saw last week's Facebook service, and it's from a long-lost cousin that I haven't seen for 25 years. And I am excited this afternoon to get in contact with her, and it was all because of you guys. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, that is wonderful. Wonderful. All right. I wanted to say one other thing. I forgot. There's so many things happened this week. My son, I told you, got you know, hit by a truck a couple weeks ago on his bicycle. Well, last week, uh, his mother took him up to Akron to get some brain scan tests, and some guy smashed into her brand new car, tried to get back up the house, shook him up pretty bad, but uh, they're, they're okay. Just, you know, great, great. More shook up than he was from being hit by the truck. Before. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Pray for Randy's son. That caused there. A okay. All right, right behind you there, Femi. Well, um, just to say that um, the sermon last week was really what I we, I needed to hear. So thank you, Pastor, for. For the sermon last week it was just Amen. powerful. Yeah, just thank God for it. Amen. Amen. All right. Here's Kim up here. Um, I just want to say that um, the Pregnancy Care Center um, does great things, and uh, we have taken up a uh, everybody have to give money for the building, and as three Sunday school classes for Orville Baptist Church, we have raised $765, and I want to thank everybody who gave to that. Um, it's, a good, it's very dear and precious, not only to Linda's heart, but to our church and to our God in heaven. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. All right. Well, let's join the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, that it is good to be with you in your presence today. I pray, Lord, that uh, as you desire that your will would be done, not only where you're at, but here upon the earth. And that, Lord, you would lead and guide and direct in this worship service. That, Lord, you would allow us to see that you are worthy of our trust that we can trust you in all things. And so, Lord, lead us to that end, I pray. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand with us as we sing, Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King. Peace, do your bride, do you? 
What a year this has been, eh? <laughs> and the political stuff, man. But you know, there's one day we are going to stand before a judge and Donald Trump isn't going to save us. Joe Biden isn't going to save us. Mike DeWine isn't going to save us. Anthony Fauci isn't going to save us. There's only one that we can, that we can trust in. And to this morning, I'm going to sing, Mercy Walked In. I stood in the courtroom, the judge turned my way. It looks like... That's when mercy 
stand with us as we sing You Are God Alone. good to be with you. We were gone last week and praise the Lord uh, that his word carries on. I want to thank uh, everyone who uh, was kind enough to send us some cards uh, in a bag. We got to see those and we read each and every word that you wrote. Some uh, added some gifts of gratitude and uh, thank you for those as well. Pastor Jerry, uh, thank you for preaching last week. I, uh, I did something last week in worship that I've never done before. That was listen to you driving down the interstate at about 70. I don't know, Matt was driving maybe close to 80 miles an hour. <clears throat> <laughs> I watched on the phone as you preached. We had it on the stereo over top, and we were able to be a part of the worship service here. And I was even able to be able to to type in amen when I, when I uh, saw a part that I enjoyed, and that was really often, but I, I'm slow, I'm old about typing things, you know, so I figured uh, 
I better stop when I did. But thank you so much for that. And uh, it was a great message on don't waste your valley. This week, I want to begin a new series. It's the first time I'm going to do this. I'm going to preach this passage today, uh, these 11 verses, for the next three weeks. Uh, these 11 verses is a, one continual story, story of Jesus meeting Peter, uh, who was called Simon at the time. And as he does, he, Jesus, becomes something to Peter that Peter didn't recognize. And I started this as a way of being able to think about it because we in, in midweek Bible study have been going through a 10-week series on the the signs of Jesus' return. And we have seen that those signs are very evident for us to see in our present day. We got to the end of the 10, and I started a, a series on so what? So what? If all this is happening before us, what does God want us to do in, right, in the light of what he is showing us in his return? So one of the things that we looked at was who we were called to be and what we were commissioned to be. What is our job here? And so I couldn't find a better passage of scripture to be able to look at. The Lord led me to this passage that, that uh, is found in Luke chapter 5. Also by happenstance, I wanted to show you this picture if you would, this is Stephen and my niece Kingsley Warren. They got married last Saturday. They were on their honeymoon last week in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and they told me when they left that they wanted to go trout fishing in Gatlinburg. And they did it that. Kingsley caught one, that's it right there. And uh, Stephen caught whatever the limit is in Gatlinburg. He caught all he could, and they had fish that night. This is a story about fishing. So let me ask you, how many of you have ever caught a fish before? Raise your hands. All right. A lot of people out here. All right. That means that each of you have a fish story. A time when you caught the big one or you caught a small one, or the big one got away. You know how it goes. You know the stories. I, I, I can't think of a better fish story, and I've told you before, and I'm going to tell you again because I like it. And when you preach, you can tell your stories. <clears throat> I was out with Neil Nairns. Matt and I were preaching, I mean preaching. Matt and I were out fishing with Neil Nairns a long time ago. And so I was out in the boat with him, and I said, Neil, what's a, what's a fish story that you got? You've been fishing. you got your own boat. Tell me a fish story. He said, well, he said, one time I was out like, like we are now. It was early in the morning. I was along the coastline there just fishing, and I saw this, this branch that was out there strung over the water. It was kind of dipped down in the water, and I saw this huge large mouth bass come up out of the water and put an acorn in the crux of a tree limb that was there on the water. I thought, wow, that is something. He says he went back down in the water and then I saw this chipmunk that was up in the tree, came down the tree, ran out the branch along the water to where the acorn was and the fish at that moment came up grabbed the chipmunk, went back down to the water. He said, I didn't know what to think about that. That was just the oddest thing. He says, and then I was still watching and wondering what's going on. And I saw this big mouth bass come back up out of the water, put that acorn back on that tree limb again. I said, Neil, that's not a true story. He said, you said you wanted a fish story. You didn't say you wanted a true one. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Neil. That's great. So I want to ask, of all the people that are out here, who has caught the biggest fish in the room? Okay? Who's caught the biggest fish? Who's caught a fish at least a half pound or bigger? Raise your hand. 
All right, who's caught a fish that's at least a pound or bigger? All right. How about two pounds or bigger? Jim's got, uh, hold my hand up here. <laughs> two pounds or bigger, okay? Hold your hands up real quick. All right. Three pounds or bigger? Wow. Wow. All right, Randy, how big was your fish? How big was your fish? About six pounds. Okay, Jim? Four pounds. Okay. Who else? Dean? Four, four pound walleye. All right. Yes, Roger? Three pounds. All right. Who else? Char uh, Violet? Four pounds. <laughs> Dave? Twelve. Twelve. All right. Is it on your wall at the house? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anybody, <laughs> Anybody catch one bigger than 12 pounds? I haven't. No. Let me ask you this. Have you ever caught so many fish that it began to sink your boat? Or more than that, you caught so many fish, it began to sink your boat and your friend's boat who was out with you. You see, that sounds like a fish story, doesn't it? Until you find out that Jesus is the one who told it. And then you can believe what he says. See, I trust what Jesus says. I trust it when he says, I am the one who can lead you to the water, take you out into the deep, and provide everything you need. So here we are in this passage of Scripture, Luke chapter 5. Why don't you stand with me as we reverence the reading of God's Word. Verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belong, belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats to the shore, left everything, and followed him. You may be seated. Actually, this wouldn't be... Peter's last fish story. As he would walk with Jesus and would minister with Jesus, he would have other fish stories that would come along. In fact, one time in Matthew chapter 17, when Peter was with Jesus, they were asked, Jesus, are you going to pay the temple tax of two drachma? And Peter says, Lord, are we going to pay that tax that we're supposed to? 
And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, go down to the lake, throw your line in the water, and the first fish you catch, open its mouth. And inside its mouth will be a coin worth four drachmas, a four drachma coin. Go pay your taxes and my taxes too. Would you trust Jesus if he told you to do that? Would you trust him to go and to get your pole and to go down to the lake and to throw it in? Or what about the time after Jesus' crucifixion, his death on the cross, his resurrection three days later, and over the next six weeks, he would appear to his disciples at different times and at different locations. And one of those times is back here at the Sea of, or the Lake of Gennesaret, which is also the Sea of Galilee. And there, the disciples are again out fishing. Peter with them. And again, they go all night long and catch nothing. And Jesus is on the shore. And they don't recognize him. And he shouts out to the boat, Friends, haven't you caught any fish? They don't know who he is. They probably think, That guy's a jerk. Haven't you caught any fish? Then Jesus calls out, Throw your nets on the right side of the boat. I can imagine as they're sitting there or standing there thinking, what does it matter? Right side, left side, it doesn't matter. Maybe I ought to go to the front and throw it out. Maybe I ought to go to the back and throw it out. Maybe I'll just toss it in the air. But when at some point they decide to throw their nets on the right side of the boat, the scripture says that they had such a large catch of fish large fish that they could not pull the net into the boat. And here we are again. And one thing that we need to look at as we begin this story is to understand this. You and I are a whole lot like Peter. Peter was a normal fisherman, not a person of stature, not a person of means. He was a fisherman. He probably looked like a fisherman. He probably smelt like a fisherman. He was just an ordinary guy who met an extraordinary God. And that changed everything in his life. And it will yours and mine as well. So this morning... We're going to look at a fish story, and all fish stories have three points to them. You didn't know that, but they do. And here is point number one. Like Peter, Jesus leads us from the shore to the shallow to the deep. Jesus is standing on the side of the lake, standing beside the lake, and the people are crowded around him. He sees these two boats. Fishermen are washing their nets. He goes and gets into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon Peter. And he asked him to put out from shore just a little bit. And he sat down and he began to teach the people. There's a book title I saw this week that just intrigued me, especially as it comes along this subject. It was entitled, The Sin of Certainty. The Sin of Certainty. When God desires our trust more than our correct beliefs. While I haven't read one word in that book, the outside cover title has great truth in it. We like certainty. We like to think we are in control. We like the normal. I don't know how many times I have heard people say, I wish we could get back to 
normal. You see, it's comfortable on the shore. That's where the crowd is. We don't stick out. We blend in. We're like everyone else. It's safe to be on the shore. It's also safe, safe to be in the shallow. You can touch in the shallow. Feet are on the ground. You ever remember those pools that used to have the deep end? They don't have them anymore. But it had a deep end and a shallow end, and there was that rope that went across the middle. And it let you know this is how far you could go before you were going to go into the deep end. Some people never leave the shallow end. They live their whole lives in the shallow water. It's comfortable. It's predictable. It's safe. But Jesus, in a moment, finishes his message. I find it intriguing that this story doesn't record his message. There are people all over the bank to the point where they were pushing him towards the water. So he decides, I'm going to get into a boat and I'm going to have them push out just a little bit. And I'm going to have an amphitheater around this so they can all hear me. So all the people are there. Peter is in the boat with him. Listening to a message that we are not privy to. I wonder what Jesus taught about that Was it about faith? Was it about trust? Was it about who he was? In this passage of scripture, it tells us that when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water, let down your nets for a catch. I just want to ask you, do you think Jesus really needed the deep waters to catch all these fish? Could he have not just caught them in the shallow water? And for that fact, couldn't he have caught them by standing on the seashore? Couldn't he have said to the fish, every fish in the Lake of Galilee on the shore in three seconds? Three, two, one, and there they were. And people were overwhelmed with fish. Why send Peter out to the deep water? Jesus calls us all to go to the deep water. Because it's in the deep water that we are required to put trust in him. Deep waters are out of our control. Deep waters are outside of our comfort level. Deep waters are where the excitement is and the crowds are not. Deep waters are where you are often found alone with God. And you meet him in those deep waters. In those times in which it is just you and him. You have pulled away from everything else, and I am putting my trust in him. And in doing that, great things can happen. You never know what's going to happen next, but he does. He knows. Point number two. We often, like Peter, question him. Peter says, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Now, if you look at that, there is no question mark at the end of that statement. It's just a statement. But I think in that statement are all kinds of questions. 
It's, Lord, I have just got done cleaning my nets. Do you want me to go out and get them dirty to have to clean them again? Lord, I don't think this is going to work. I fished all night and I've listened to you preach all morning and I'm tired. Can I go to bed? You see, we have questions all the time. He's probably listening to himself as we sometimes listen to ourselves. When the Lord is speaking, it is also us speaking back saying, I don't know about this. I don't know, this is not gonna work. This sounds too crazy to happen. I can imagine that Peter looks around at the others who are in the boat and saying, what am I gonna do? What am I going to do? And the scripture says, because you say so, Jesus, I will let down the nets. Whenever Jesus commands you to do something, he always knows something that you don't. Whenever he commands you to do something, he always knows something that you don't. You see, right now, we need to know some things about God. We need to know that he is indeed sovereign over the events of this world. He is sovereign over the fish of the sea, and he is sovereign over the events of this country. And even if you and I may not understand what his will is, we can trust this. We can trust his wisdom and his knowledge of what he knows, even when we can't. The kingdom of God is so much bigger, so, so, so much bigger than the kingdom of America. And Jesus Christ is still king. He is king of kings and Lord of lords. He is ruling and reigning as a song said from his throne. The throne in which he left to come here to be the son of God and to be in a boat with a man named Peter and to show himself as he was the Lord of all. And he is on the throne today, coming back again soon to be able to show the world that he is king. Know this, in the end, the church will endure. The church will will not be defeated. We may go through some harder times in the times to come as Christians in this world, but know this, the church will not be defeated. For the same Peter who has asked, who do you say that I am by Jesus? G uh, Peter responded, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church will not fall. It will not fail. And Peter in this moment does something that is rather remarkable. He doesn't thank him for the fish. He doesn't send her with his mouth wide open thinking, wow, I never saw this many fish before. He falls prostrate upon his face before the Lord because at that moment it is no longer about fish it is about the one who has called the fish it is no longer about him being a fisherman is who he is as a man because it says that he falls upon his face verse 8 when P Simon Peter saw this he fell at Jesus' feet and said go away from me Lord, I am a sinful man. What a strange remark 
that really it's not strange at all. Because if you go to Isaiah, when Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up, the first thing that comes to his mind, he says, woe is me. He doesn't, he doesn't awe in his appearance. He doesn't raise his hands in praise. He falls and he says, woe is me. I am a man who lives among people of unclean lips. And I am a man of unclean lips. In this moment, He sees Jesus for who Jesus is. It's interesting. In verse 5, Peter refers to Jesus as master, which in the Greek is translated teacher or chief or maybe even commander. But here in verse 8, he refers to him as Lord. Go away from me, Lord. It means supreme in authority. He knows in this moment, here is one whom he has never known before. Peter is on his face in the midst of the biggest catch of fish in his life, and he realizes this man in his boat is Lord of all and who he is in his presence. I am a sinful man. I have in my life seen God do more in a few minutes on my knees than I have seen him do in hours at my desk. And when we get to the place where we will take him serious for who he is, he says, get off of the shore. Get out of the shallow. Come with me. I'm calling you to the deep where you don't trust in yourself and you don't trust in your comfort and you're not looking for the normal. You are looking for me. And anything can happen at that moment. Even so many fish that sinks two boats or just about. It's remarkable that Jesus stopped the fish from coming. They didn't sink. They just about sunk. I believe the water was pretty close to the top. But what was remarkable in that is the biggest catch that Peter would have ever caught in his life and maybe more than he had caught in a week and maybe more than he had caught in a month or maybe he had more than he caught in a number of months. He turns his back on and walks away. Then Jesus said to Simon Peter, do not be afraid for now you will catch men. Matthew's account of this in Matthew chapter 4 says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and left everything and followed him. Crowd of people maybe still there Maybe is still watching this Jesus who had just spoken to them, maybe on the shore, and they're pulling the boats in, and here they are coming in with boats so full of fish, and Peter walks away. Fish for everyone. I don't need them anymore. I got a new fishing partner, and we're not going to follow. We're not going to fish for this kind of fish anymore. See, Jesus was asking Peter this question. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? And he's asking us the same today. Next week, we're going to look at this call of Peter, this call upon his life. 
And then the following week, we're going to look at the commission that he is calling Peter to. What is it that he has called him away from and what is he calling him to do? Because all of this kind of wraps together. Wednesday Bible study, 10 weeks of signs of his coming back. A new series of so what, what do you want me to do? And a call of Peter, a call that says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Will you bow your heads with me? In this time of invitation, the question for you question for Peter was are you ready to leave the shore are you ready to leave the shallow and come with me to the deep are you willing to trust me no matter what I ask you to do are you willing to trust me because I am Lord I am supreme in authority over all the world And what I am calling you to do is to come and follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. This morning, we may have people in the room that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And today would be the day in which you would reach out to him and receive his grace and his mercy and his pardon for your sins. You would believe on his death, his burial, and his resurrection for your pardon for your sins. And today would be the day that you find salvation and security in him. Or maybe you're here today and you're just hoping that things get back to normal. You're tired of the pandemic. You're tired of the election. You're tired of the stuff that's going on in life right now. You just wish it was normal again. And the Lord is saying, I am not a God of the normal. I'm a God of the deep. Will you trust me? Father, I commit these next moments to you to receive any who would place their trust in you today, whether for the very first time or renewing that trust and saying, Lord, this is what I want. I want you more than I want fish. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to hearts today. This altar is open. The next few minutes, as the music is played, will you bring people to your way and yourself? In Jesus' name I pray. Put your trust in him again.